All right, so now it's 6.05 Japanese time, so we'll be ready to start. So hello everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today at our first ever Gourmet Pro webinar series, Start Exporting to Japan. I'm so delighted to welcome people from all over the world and introduce you to our first topic, the ins and outs of Japan's food and beverage distribution. I'm, my name is Pulina and I'll be the moderator for today. So before we dig deeper into today's webinar, I would like to walk you through, to, through today's outline. So first we're going to start with some small introductions about our presenter and panelists. So we have a better understanding who will be speaking today. Our first part of the webinar is also going to be a presentation about the distribution landscape in Japan. You might be wondering why we're including that today, but oftentimes when we talk with our customers or with people outside of Japan, we hear that Japan is perceived like a black box or people don't really understand how the distribution works here, why Japan is so different than the rest of the world. And there's this cultural and language barriers that keep some additional challenges. So today's presentation uh, is Today's presentation goal is to provide you with the needed tools and also insights to open this black box and get some more, uh, let's say, courage to dive deeper into the panel discussion. So the second part of our webinar is going to be the panel discussion that's going to be about 40 minutes. And we are going to challenge our panelists with five questions. You're going to hear more about their experience, but also get some invaluable tips about the Japan's distribution. In the end, we will fi fin finalize our webinar with a Q&A session. So please make sure to add your questions in the chat box. Today we have 80 plus attendees and maybe they'll be increasing. So make sure you add your questions in the chat box below and I'll be reading through them throughout the discussion. Also, we've prepared a small surprise for everybody that joined today. So please stay tuned until the end. And before we start with the introductions, I would like to say my biggest thanks to today's organizer, Gourmet Pro. Gourmet Pro is the food and beverage expert network here in Japan that's leveraging its consultants' expertise to help international food and beverage uh, companies enter the Japanese market. Through our Market Chicks newsletter, but also through this uh, webinar series, we aim to equip uh, our listeners and viewers with the needed information about the opportunities here in Japan. And with our services, we always try to support those companies uh, enter and strategize uh, the Japanese food and beverage market. So we are ready to start and I would like to welcome our presenter, Vincent, and our panelists, Don and Pascal, to the Zoom stage. So thank you so much. So Hello I would everyone. like, <laughs> hi Vincent, how are you today? Can you please share a little bit more about yourself? Yes, so nice to meet you everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us today. Uh, my name is Vincent, I'm the Chief uh, Strategy Officer at Gourmet Pro and I've been also in this uh, food and beverage industry in Japan, um, working uh, for the last 15 years as a marketer, a business developer and also as a, as a consultant. And I'm very happy to see that they, you are all joining us today, uh, much more uh, participant than expected, and uh, very happy also to share our expertise with this, uh, with this very first uh, webinar format for us. Thank you so much, Vincent, and we are super happy to have you here today, and I'm excited to what type of insight you'll be sharing with us later today. So I would like to welcome as well Don and Pascal. So. Thank you so much for joining us today. And Don, could you please share a little bit more about yourself as well? Yeah, hi there, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Don Roxburgh, and I'm an original New Zealander. And four years ago, I left my career in finance and investment and founded Wholesome Japan to try and bring Japan closer to foreign markets. Uh, we also, at Wholesome Japan, we import natural food and skincare products that are healthy both for our customers and the environment. We distribute them directly to Japan's top wholesalers as well as independent retailers 
And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the conversation tonight and um, hopefully some of uh, what we have to talk about is of, of value for you. Thank you all for coming and joining us. Thank you so much, Don. I'm so excited to hear your perspective from the importer side of you. So looking forward to our discussion. And I would like to welcome Pascal as well. Ah, can you unmute? Yes. Okay, unmute easy. All right, hello everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Pascal Javagaya, I'm French. I'm currently joining today to share part of my experience as a former Asia director for Biosebon Japan, so the largest organic retail chain, uh, which I started here in 2016 from scratch as a JV between Eon Group, the largest retailer in Japan, about 25% of the whole uh, retail food retail in Japan, and French Biosebon Group, which we grew from so zero store in 2016 to 26 stores as of now. Uh, currently, I am acting as an independent consultant for food and beverage, uh, advising especially European companies trying to enter Japan. I'm also a trade advisor for the French government and um, an administrator of the French Chamber of Commerce in Japan. Very glad to be here tonight, and I hope you will enjoy uh, our discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. Super excited to have you here today, and I'm really excited to hear your story about the retail side of the distribution in Japan. So looking forward to our final discussion a little bit later today. And as I mentioned in the start of our Webinar, my name is Polina and I'll be the moderator for today. I'm the customer experience manager at Gourmet Pro and I help connecting our wonderful clients from abroad with our uh, experts here in Japan. So if you have any questions, please feel free to connect with me later. So I would like to welcome Vincent to our Zoom stage today and start with our presentation about the food and beverage distribution in Japan. Thank you, Paulina. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so before we start, just a, a very quick reminder uh, on Japan. So as you know, Japan is the third largest uh, economy in the world, and uh, the country is highly dependent on food import. Um, Japan is one of the largest export market for uh, vegetables, fruits, meat, but also like more specific categories as uh, wine, for example, olive oil, cheese, uh, to name a few. Um, and also, Japan is probably one of the most uh, sophisticated market in the world. I think some people, me including, will say it's the most, actually the most sophisticated market in the world. Um, and to give you an example, uh, all the people you can see here are actually like world champions. So you have here the best um, barista, the best bartender, the best sommelier even like the best uh, olive oil producer, believe it or not. And um, this is not a cliche, actually, you know, we, we, we've seen that, that uh, the, the Japanese uh, get awarded, you know, in, in across different categories and so on and so on. I think um, even apart from these very talented champions in our industry here in Japan, uh, we meet almost every day with an incredible number of people having this commitment to excellence. Uh, with this in mind, let's, let's move to one of the quick questions for today. So what does it take to export to Japan? I'm not going to uh, cover all the topics here. I'm sure that our panelists also will give you a sense of uh, what does it takes uh, in terms also of mindset and, and, and so on. I just wanted to highlight a few uh, factors of success. So first of all, superior products. So this is true in any market for sure but especially in Japan for the reason that I just mentioned, which is uh, the very high expectations in terms of quality, taste, texture, but also like uh, the package, the design and so on. The second key factor of success is uh, having dedicated resource. So do not assume that entering in Japanese market will be uh, an easy move. It's not at all. And, and Japan is a very demanding market. Uh, it can take months of discussion with you providing uh, a, a, an incredible number of documents until you see the discussion actually moving forward 
and the project uh, starting. So you need to have the proper resource and also you need to have a very resilient mindset. Last aspect is uh, related to the discussion we will have together today, which is finding your winning route to market. I think we all have experience about finding and selecting uh, the best, you know, uh, the right channel, let's say, and, and the best importers for this channel. But we all know that this is not like one single uh, answer. It's all up to your project, your product, your scale, your expectation, and also to your company culture as well. So today for this uh, presentation part, we wanted to focus on this particular topic, distribution structure, potential import partners, the distribution landscape as well, with a focus for today, mostly on the retail channels. Ideally, at the end of the presentation, I would like you to understand what is uh, the overall distribution structure and maybe uh, pick up the name of a few key distributors. So first, um, let's have a look at the geography. So you can see there is the map of Japan that you know, uh, you cannot see Okinawa, but you have like almost uh, all the key regions. And this is actually the, this is an overview of the retail sales by region. What you can see is that there are mostly like three uh, top regions. The first is Kanto with uh, Tokyo and Yokohama. The second is Kansai with Osaka, Kobe and Kyoto. And the third one is the Chubu region with Nagoya, but also uh, Niigata and uh, Nagano. So basically these three regions together represent 70% of the total uh, food sales in Japan. So when you have discussion with potential importers, my advice is always that you try to, 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 to understand better uh, what is their geographical coverage. But you can also uh, decide to focus on one region or one city if, uh, if it makes it easier for you to build both the distribution and uh, the brand awareness. So obviously, Tokyo is the largest city in the world, so that could be a good start. Uh, but also the Kansai region, for example, is similar to Switzerland in terms of uh, GDP. Uh, Nagoya is a huge city with seven, seven million people, I think, uh, within the, just the prefecture. And, and there are lots of uh, different areas in Japan that you can enter this way with this kind of local uh, strategy. So just keep in mind that you don't have to enter the Japanese market on a nationwide scale if this is not matching your resource, or simply if you just want to maximize your learnings before investing more uh, in the market. Let's move to the distribution part. So here is the, the distribution structure for the food sales in retail uh, channel. So I think this gives you the overall picture uh, with basically these three different layers. You have the importers and uh, the wholesalers and the retailers, okay? So let's start from the importers. So historically, mostly specialized importers and trading companies. But in the last 10 years, more and more retailers and more and more uh, wholesalers are acting as importers. Corina, maybe show the, come back to the slide. Yeah, thank you. So depending on your industry, large manufacturers as well might act as uh, importers. So this is quite common, for example, in the alcoholic beverage industry with uh, the leading companies like Suntory, Kirin, uh, Sapporo, Asahi, acting as importers. And it's less common for packet food. The second layer are the wholesalers. So the large majority of the business is actually going through these wholesalers and the direct sales between the importers and the retailers are very limited, except for a few fresh products, uh, agricultural products, for example. And then you have the retailers that I'm going to, to introduce in a few minutes. So let's have a look at uh, your potential import partners. So to summarize, you have the choice roughly between these four types of importers. So let me start from the trading companies, the Shosha, or, or what we call the Sobo Shosha. So some of you might be familiar with company names as Marubeni, Itochu, uh, Mitsubishi, Sumitomo, for example. Basically, they are 
huge companies. They are like giant uh, trading houses, highly diversified. They have business across all kinds of industries. And they invest a lot in agriculture and food manufacturing as well. So to give you an example, Itochu just acquired one of the largest vegetable oil company in Europe a few months ago. So these trading companies are a very powerful route to market, not only because they are big, but also because they actually own the largest wholesalers and they own also uh, some of the largest retailers, which are their subsidiaries, basically. And because of their size, you can imagine also that they are potentially connected with almost any possible distribution company in Japan or supplier. The problem is that they are very, very selective, very price driven, and also they always want to tap in very large market space. So when you meet these people, they will the first uh, when you show the, the any any project any numbers, they will start like looking at the size of the price, for example, and try to assess what is their potential business here. And and usually they are thinking big. So for this reason also, they are not often interested in emerging categories if it's if it, the size of the market is still uh, too limited so they might be a great partner if your company is, is an industry leader if you have a unique technology or any kind of competitive advantage but they are very difficult as you can uh, imagine to approach as uh, an importer and to engage as an importer the second one is the large uh, large importers so an obvious choice. Most of them are leaders in, uh, in, in specific categories or specific countries. Montevusan, for example, for Italian foods or uh, Allied Corporation for Thai food, for example. They have large sales team, depending on the company, but I will say probably like between 20 and, and 50, 60 people. They run their business on a nationwide scale and they are working with all the top wholesalers and most of the top retailers and probably also most of the top food service operators. The problem is that they are difficult to motivate. They have lots of choice. You are not the first uh, to contact them. They uh, basically have um, the possibility to, to supply product from tons of different brands. They visit the international trade shows. They receive lots of emails every day and they are very picky. So also, this is a little bit like personal, but based on my experience, I will say that too many of them are not also really interested in innovation, innovative categories. So when you start talking with them, I think it's critical that you be very well prepared and also be able to demonstrate your brand potential with uh, relevant trade stories, market research, consumer survey, whatever you can build to demonstrate your brand potential. But do not expect them to do uh, this job by themselves, unfortunately. Then we have here the niche importers. So basically small and independent companies, often with five to 10 employees. And in Japan, we could say that most of them are very passionate people. I think we all have this experience of dealing with this kind of people. They want to know everything about the product. Uh, they want to know the story, they want to know the process. They, if you are a family-owned business, they might ask you lots of questions about your family story, for example. And this is really what you can provide, actually, to start the, to kick off the discussion with them. You can share with them like very detailed presentation, like, like I don't know, 20 page, 30 page, 40 page of PowerPoint with all the details. You know, it will not never been enough for them. Uh, they will look across this kind of details. So these importers are actually the best option for many of our clients, especially as a first step to test the market potential. The difficulty here, I think this is also related to what I mentioned earlier on the geographical coverage, for example, is really to understand who they are, what they do, what is their distribution, uh, identify also their strengths and their weakness. My advice will be also that you are prepared to support them in an efficient way for example, if, if you believe they don't have the right marketing capabilities, maybe this is something you can do investing also in the market locally uh, to find the right level of uh, support of your importer. Last uh, option 
is a very good option, which is about uh, the retailers. So direct import. So the problem is only a few retailers are actually importing in direct. Ion, the largest uh, retail company that uh, Pascal just uh, mentioned earlier, has been directly importing for a long time. Sejoichi and Caldi also, which are the leading international grocery chains, they are very active. Costco, uh, for organic products, Biosebon also, that, uh, that Pascal has been managing in the last years. And recently, I think there is a trend around the regular supermarket chains, especially the, the regional supermarkets, trying to develop their own direct import activities. But for now, I think it's often limited to a few products easy to import as pasta, for example, olive oil, wine, because most of these um, importers still lack of in-house expertise. So if you work with those kind of regular supermarkets, um, you will need to provide them a huge support on the regulatory or the product development side. For most of the brand, I think Sejo Ishi and Caldi will be often ideal partners. They have hundreds of stores, high rotation, dedicated also uh, import subsidiaries, and they have also uh, an incredible expertise on the product. Uh, to give you an idea, a few years ago, I've been visiting a factory with the CEO of Sejo Ishi, and I was, I was supposed to translate. But actually, before the factory manager even started to speak, the CEO of Sejo Ishi was explaining everything to his team. He knew all the details about the process, the ingredients, uh, the name of the machine, you know, everything. And the factory manager was looking at me and, and, and telling me, wow, I never met anyone who know that much about what we do while they are visiting the factory for the first time. So the message here, be very prepared again when you discuss with these customers because they will ask you lots of questions and they are very keen also on, on those kind of technical details. So let's come back to the, to the wall sellers. So here we are talking mostly about eight very large companies in the retail channels and around 10 companies in the food service channels. So you can, you can see some of them here, Mitsubishi, Nippon Access, Kokubu, Mitsui Food, and also Nishuhan for the wine. And on top of this, there is also like Itochu Food, uh, et cetera. So basically almost any food and beverage companies, especially for packaged foods, are working with these top wholesalers. And the reason is that the retail landscape is extremely fragmented in Japan. I think this is something you want to remember. There are literally thousands of food retail chains, including very small companies with like two, three stores. To give you an idea, the top uh, 30 retail chains account for less than 30% of the total retail sales. So in this context, obviously you can imagine that this is a nightmare for importers and local manufacturers to directly supply or even invoice uh, all the supermarkets. And similarly, on the retail side, most of the chain rely a lot on the wholesalers for their own category management. No one is uh, strongly challenging the role of the wholesalers and they might not be disrupted in the short term, but obviously more and more companies are trying also to establish uh, direct businesses. So I want to share more about the, the, the function. You can see here on the slide, you know, um, some details, but at least I think it's good that you keep in mind uh, the company names when you talk with importers, first to clarify if they work with them or not, but also um, because when an importer tells you that they have a distribution of 10,000 stores, for example, maybe it just means that they are working with a wholesaler distributing product in 10,000 stores. So it's very common for exporters to realize too late often that there is a big gap between what they expect from the importer in terms of coverage and the reality of their distribution. Let's move to the last topic, which are the retailers. So here we just pick up a few sub channels for you to understand. There are obviously more channels. There is also like this kind of traditional trade, for example, which is obviously uh, declining in specific industries like alcoholic beverage. We have also here uh, the liquor shop, for example. And um, if you look at this, you see here, the numbers here are basically the store numbers. In terms of 
channels or sub channels, you can see that the market, the retail market is basically led by the supermarkets, uh, which are like large to small supermarkets, even sometimes very small supermarkets in, um, in, in central Tokyo, for example, there are lots of these uh, with a chain like My Basket, for example, and a few very large uh, shopping center. So Ion, for example, Ion Mall. But if you look at the overall distribution, actually there are only a very few national chains. Most of the supermarkets are regional supermarkets. To give you an idea, when we work on a business case, for example, we will often look at least at the top, uh, top 30 or top 50 regional supermarkets. Then you can see that there, are, there is a lot, a huge number of uh, convenience stores. So they are everywhere, everywhere across Japan, not only uh, in Tokyo, not only in uh, big cities, they are also in Hokkaido and so on. And unlike the supermarkets, they are very consolidated with mostly three chains, 7-Eleven, Family Mart, and Lawson. And actually Lawson uh, this morning acquired a, a small chain in, uh, in the Kansai region this morning. But for most of exporters, I think the convenience store channel is extremely difficult to access. Do not ex expect to have your products uh, listed here if you were not in the market for a few years. They are very, very strict, especially uh, on, on the quality, on the product quality, shelf life. They will take a very high margin and so on. So a difficult channel to approach, except maybe Natural Lawson, which is a small subsidiary of Lawson, carrying lots of imported products, especially natural product, organic products, through uh, a network of specialized importers. For imported food, there is um, obviously higher opportunities with the, the two remaining channels that you can see here, international supermarkets, with Sejoishi and Kaldi that we already mentioned, and also um, the cash and carry with Costco, which is very established, very successful in Japan. Now they have 30 stores uh, everywhere in Japan. And also a chain like Gyomu Supa, which has been very successful recently. I think they will soon have 1,000 stores and they're actually uh, important direct. So that's it for the, the key retailers. If you are interested in better understanding the, the retail distribution, we also have a very complete report on this Japan food retail landscape that you can find also on, uh, on our website. On top of this, obviously e-commerce is becoming a very large channel. Until 2019, e-commerce will represent, in average, 5% of the sales for most of the brand. At the moment, for some of the brand we support, it's up to 15 to 20% of their sales. Uh, and this is obviously a very interesting topic. So if you are interested in, in this, maybe we can have also a dedicated webinar in the future. Uh, but I'm, I'm not going to develop. Just remember that there is, in Japan, Lakuten, which is a platform, and Amazon also is very strong. So that's it for this session. I will now uh, let our panelists share with you more about their expertise and experience, and maybe we can dive also into uh, more details during the, the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your time, Vincent, and for explaining so many interesting insights and a lot of details about wholesaler, importers, distributors. And I hope our viewers can actually like learn why Japan is so different than the rest of the world. And as you said, remember a few key names about distributors and importers and wholesalers. So thank you so much. And if you have any questions towards Vincent, please put them in the chat box. Uh, and I would like to apologize for the glitch with the presentations because I had to switch them uh, because we had some comments that it was not visible well. So I hope now is okay. Uh, so I would like to welcome Don and Pascal for our panel discussion and move forward to our second part of the webinar. All right, so thank you so much for joining us again. Um, so we would like to dive deeper into more details about your experiences and get some insightful tips for our viewers. So let's start with our first question. We shortly heard about your experience and uh, short story about yourself so in the beginning of the webinar but we would love to hear a little bit more about what was your role in the Japanese food and beverage distribution 
So maybe we can start with Dom. Uh, could you please share some more details what you've been doing in the past four years as an importer in Japan? Yes, thanks, Paulina. Uh, four years ago, I'm probably at the same situation as a lot of you on the call today. I didn't know anything about um, the Japanese uh, retail uh, landscape and how to import products into Japan. Since then, uh, we've kind of emerged as an importer of a niche importer of products in the, the better for you segment and the health and beauty segment. And um, we work with directly with the suppliers and in their home countries and act as their representatives in Japan and um, doing a lot of the hard work and the Japanese language work that they aren't able to do. And because we started with no track record, we've been starting with relatively small producers. So that, would, that has its challenges because we don't have a lot of budget and we're trying to um, bootstrap our way through the Japanese market, which is not easy. Uh, that being said, we have been successful in getting products placed into uh, the high-end uh, international supermarkets and uh, into Natural Lawson as uh, the, the convenience store that um, Vincent mentioned before. Uh, we To get them there, though, we've had to cover things like uh, whether they can be imported to Japan, labeling, uh, and also working directly with uh, the various channels to facilitate that uh, that. Um, that product reaching the end user. We also sell online as well, directly in, on Rakuten and uh, Shopify, which is uh, uh, the, one of the key platforms that we use. Thank you so much, Don, for the introduction. It's really interesting to hear about how much you've achieved in the past four years. So I'm looking forward to hear more about in the next question. So Pascal, could you please go ahead and share a bit more about yourself as well? Sure. So I think I will focus on uh, my experience with, uh, with Biosebon. So as I said, Biosebon uh, in Japan uh, is a JV uh, between the mother company of the, this French retailer, specializing in small to mid-sized supermarkets in Europe, uh, with a total, uh, as of last year, of 170 stores, um, mostly in France, but also Belgium. Um, Italy, Spain, uh, well, didn't end up very well in, in Europe because they finally got acquired by Carrefour. But in 2015, Eon approached uh, Biosebon with the idea to launch uh, the brand uh, in Japan because they wanted to have a mid-sized uh, supermarket and develop basically expand the market for organic products. So I was uh, hired in 2016, uh, once the deal has been signed with, uh, with Eon uh, as a 50-50 joint, joint venture to launch and develop uh, the chain in Japan. The fact that, well, the, at that time, uh, the peculiarity uh, regarding uh, organic market is basically there was virtually no organic market in, uh, in Japan. Very few products, uh, very few, a lot of um, misconceptions, not much understanding about what was organic. And as a retailer, we were facing a lot of issues, no products. So once we started uh, the first tools, we had the flagship was only having 3,000 products in our total assortment uh, versus uh, about 6,000 units SKUs in Europe for the same size size of stores. Five years forward, uh, we now have about uh, our local Japanese, um, basically the balance is about 50-50 um, for about the same balance also um, years ago. So to face the lack of uh, local organic products, we had to develop a direct import to be able to line the product on the shelves with uh, interesting uh, products, as well as complete the, basically the holes we had uh, in the racket, uh, because we're not able to, to offer uh, a good assortment to the customers. So for that, over the years, uh, we started importing grocery uh, and wine by container, sea freight. Then we moved into temperature controlled uh, fresh products. So namely from France, as well as Italy, for all kinds of uh, various products, ranging from hams, desserts, uh, yogurt, vegan yogurts, uh, cheeses, obviously. Uh, and then finally, we have endeavored a little bit into frozen goods. So basically developing different supply chains, uh, being separate efforts uh, to be able to cater to the needs of our customers. Uh, those customers being mostly, let's say, rather high-end uh, 
quite uh, demanding customers, obviously. Um, but having that good assortment, having that, those good products enabled uh, the change of growth from one store to 26 stores as of now, uh, within a short time frame of four years. Um, recently, also, the company launched its e-commerce sales. So currently, um, the brand is covering everything from in-store retail with different formats, large, super, well, small to large supermarkets, um, supermarket corners as well in department stores, uh, as well as the network in the Canto area. So retailer mostly, and then e-commerce operator as of late, um, as well as importer basically to cover Thank you. Thank you so much, Pascal, for sharing this exciting story of Biosebon and how much the brand and also the supermarket team developed in the past uh, couple of years. So that's extremely exciting. And the fact that uh, it's both importer and a retailer uh, means it's going to be a lot of interesting stories to share with us uh, later on. So I'm quite excited about that as well. So to move on to the next question, um, uh, we understand that Don is facing the import side, Pascal is facing both importer and retailer side, and both of them are working not only with uh, local Japanese partner, Japanese consumers, but also with international companies. So I would like to learn more about your perspective on what are the common mistakes uh, international companies are having in their route to market strategies. So shall we start with Pascal this time? Sure, I think uh, Don also has a lot of things to say. So um, we will try not to step on each other's toes. Um, probably, and, and that was also developed by, by Vincent, um, the fact that Japan is an, island, well, an archipelago, uh, basically, means that you have a very strong uh, culture here, uh, including a very strong business culture. And also uh, sometimes the inability uh, to discuss or let's say have, this, well, negotiations in, in very good English, especially for the smaller, more specialized uh, niche importers. That's not true for the big social so shall we are hiring uh, some of the most talented and bright people uh, in Japan. So as an importer, um, common, or as an exporter, uh, a common mistake, uh, I would say, would be to um, misjudge or not take into account uh, the difficulty of the intercultural um, fact in the negotiation. The fact that if a Japanese person is going to tell you yes, doesn't mean a yes, basically. It means just like he's hearing you, but you're not one step further to make a, to make a deal. So the ability to, be, to understand um, this um, negotiation ways, the way how you do that, how you close the deal, um, potentially so through an interpreter, through a consultant like Roma Pro, uh, I think is key. Otherwise, you may spend a lot of time and resources uh, without getting anywhere. So be careful of that. Uh, it's quite easy. Well, it, the market is interesting. It's still the third largest economy in the world. Uh, the Japanese consumers are very interested in new, innovative products. They're always, uh, they have a keen eye uh, for that. But um, getting to negotiate um, with sometimes companies which are having different standards, as you have, uh, can be a pitfall. So be careful of that. Yeah, thank you for sharing that and emphasizing how cultural differences are a really important factor between negotiation. Because oftentimes you also hear from our side that uh, cultural differences, language barriers, or just not understanding the Japanese ways of thinking is quite difficult. So uh, having, giving this tip to be careful about it is actually so valuable. Um, and Don, could you please share about your perspective on that question? Sure. Um... I think I could sum it up in one word. Um, the biggest mistake is underestimating. Um, and there's two aspects to that. Uh, one is underestimating the time it's going to take. And you can't expect it to be done in the, in the same speed that you might be used to in your, both your home markets and other Western or other Asian markets. It's going to take longer. Um, and the second part is uh, underestimating your ability on the quality control. So you need to be at the top of your game on the quality control and also um, 
even though you may have few problems in other markets, I can almost guarantee that you will probably have challenges in Japan. So make sure that you've got good systems in place to on that aspect. Um, when we're talking about quality control, just an example that is still is quite puzzling for me as a foreigner. Um, I got a I got a request from uh, a manager in uh, in a retail chain with about twenty or thirty outlets to replace one of one of my products, which is a literally a, a three dollar bar, because it didn't have the for some machine reason the machine mis didn't stamp the expiry date on it. So the worker at the in the store maybe even the store manager has spent st time reporting up the chain to their manager who spent their time to, to ask me to send a replacement bar to this store. So that's just kind of uh, a little anecdote about the level of expectation. And also um, when we're talking about um, what Vincent and, and um, Pascal mentioned about how your partners are going to screen you and, and take some time and to be confident with you, they, they are caught in the middle as well. So um, you need to be able to um, be delivering product at a, at a good quality. Yes, thank you so much for those tips as well. Having good quality, but also be patient with the time it takes to enter the Japanese market. It's really, really crucial because uh, what I've heard before as well, and what we've all experienced that some people really try to rush it up or they don't really think that Japan's uh, quality standards are that high. So uh, there are a lot of challenges down the road if people are not prepared and have the, the right mindset. So thank you so much for sharing those wonderful tips about the challenges. So we can now move to the next question. So now I want to dig deeper uh, in your experience uh, and I want to uh, understand better what are the most challenging experiences you had in your careers and import, distributing, retailing. So Don, could you please start uh, and tell us more about the most challenging story or stories that you had in the past four years? Sure. Um, we, I, I had something pr prepared in my mind, but I'm kind of changing on what, what I was going to talk about. I think coming back to the cultural aspect, um, one of the challenges I have in, with my niche products, which are, they need explanations to the Japanese consumer. And my suppliers in their home countries are used to being able to talk in normal late native English language and their customers are uh, understand, able to interpret that. But when you're trying to convey the value proposition of, or, of a new uh, or um, a new emerging product that the Japanese market is not aware of, it, it takes a lot of time and care to get that translation correct because Japanese language is quite nuanced. So for me with my products and the portfolio I have, spending time on getting that right is one of the, and also having the understanding of my suppliers is a key challenge. And they kind of, some of the stories or the explanations of the products are not able to be translated directly into Japanese or into the Japanese market. So there's a communication challenges between the, what the brand is trying to convey and also how to explain that into the Japanese market. Some of it, it comes from the, the home countries that they're talking about um, cultural aspects that you've got to think in, think very laterally to be able to convey into Japanese. And other, and other things, for example, um, the... Japan is a little bit behind other countries when it comes to diet trends. So I have some products that are in the paleo category, but my Japanese consumers, they don't know what paleo means. So we have to talk back and, and be able to explain the background to it, to that sort of dietary trend um, in order to uh, explain the value add proposition for the, the products. So getting that right and the right nuance and the right a tone is very challenging. That's so interesting. And uh, I love the story because 
having those cultural differences as we talked before and also uh, imagining only that if you're trying to have the same let's say market entry in your let's say uh, your closest country next to you or uh, just duplicate it in Japan is oftentimes not going to work and positioning and having the right messaging is so important uh, and I really love the story and uh, I'm so curious to know how those uh, let's say your clients got overcome it or how did they accept that they need to change uh, their, let's say, brand image or brand message. So that's so exciting and so interesting. Um, and Pascal, how about your point of view? What was the most challenging experience in your uh, Biosebon career? I'll start with, uh, I would support Tully and concur with that. It's done um, the explanation, uh, the marketing basically of your product is going to be key. Um, because first of all, you may have, uh, nobody's waiting for your product. So it's not because it's selling overseas uh, in a different cultural context that it will just do as well uh, here in Japan. You may have the best product in the world. Nobody knows about it in Japan. And in some cases, you're even arriving into an environment for which the product you're having uh, is actually being totally different or the same idea, the same word is used in a totally different context. Uh, to give an example, uh, at Biosebon, we started importing from Germany, Radwurst, so the local typical uh, German sausage. Uh, the thing is, Radwurst in Japan, the word has been used to sell local Japanese sausages, which have absolutely nothing in common uh, with what a, a typical traditional um, the sausage from Germany would be. So the Japanese consumers had already a preconceived idea about what a sausage should be, which is absolutely nowhere close to the concept of what a traditional real German sausage is. So you have to um, debunk basically the myth, try to go back to the roots, explain that. And that's a lot of time, money spent, explanation, people on the ground, tasting events also to get the product to, to get the people to get to know the product and recognizing it's good until they can make the purchase. So don't underestimate that. It, it requires uh, quite significant effort on the part of, uh, of the importer um, when it comes goes to the retailer to promote the product. And these efforts, the importer, uh, the wholesaler will ask you as a manufacturer to cover a part of part totality of that cost. So be ready uh, to to be well to be confronted with that because uh, that's really required uh, if you want to be successful on the long run in in Japan. Um, then to change a little bit uh, and go to another topic, I would say one of the the key or most challenging things you need to do in Japan is the attention to detail and especially uh, when importing products, you have to cover two things, uh, the list of ingredients and the process. So those are requirements uh, to be able to import the product. And the list, the ingredient list goes into a lot of details. So it's not just like first degree, it goes up to third degree, uh, listing where is the provenance of the ingredients of your ingredients of your ingredients. So you need to give all the details uh, about the process, all the details about your ingredients, and it's not because your importer wants to be able to copy your product and just redo it in Japan. It's just because the regulation is like this. And some, um, the fact is that in Japan, some of the ingredients that you may be using in, in Europe may be illegal, uh, may be considered as uh, allergens in Japan. Uh, take, for example, the um, uh, soba, uh, which is the, the buckwheat. Uh, buckwheat in Japan will find very easily, like uh, the soba, noodles, for example, but still it's considered as an allergen, which is not the case in Europe. So you have to change the labeling to be able to do that. And you have to identify very clearly uh, if there is possible contamination, cross-contamination in your product. And if you do not, uh, then you can be expected to run into a lot of trouble, uh, as actually we did before. So once we started Biosebon, as I said, we needed to cover uh, basically to bring products from, of, from Europe because we didn't have any, any resources. So we endeavored to bring uh, in the first two containers, 1,200 SKUs at one time. Uh, to give an idea, that's never done before. We managed to go and bring uh, at the end of the day, 
to get approved 700 SKUs out of the 1,200. And that was the largest amount of first time product imported in Japan ever done. And we did that in six months, but with crazy amount of work. So we had about six people in Japan, six people in France full time working on just getting that right. And at the end of the day, um, about half, you know, 500 SKUs we couldn't get through. Why? Because some of the importers just didn't have the information. Uh, some of the exporters, sorry, some of the manufacturers didn't bother to go fetch that information or they didn't themselves know. They were not, um, we couldn't reach them. They did not answer. Uh, some of the ingredients we discovered that they were forbidden in Japan. So for example, we imported some biscuits um, from France, which had some poppy seeds in that. So obviously grilled, roasted poppy seeds. And the thing is in Japan, you need to show that those poppy seeds have been roasted over 200 degrees. Otherwise it's considered as you know, live poppy seed. And what you do with poppy seed, you plant them, you water them. Oh, you have poppy. What do you do with poppy? A lot of interesting drug stuff. So we were called up uh, at the customs and uh, basically I was accused of being a, a drug dealer and drug importer. So <laughs> could have some uh, very interesting uh, consequences for my life in Japan, basically, uh, which fortunately we managed to avoid. Um, but we ended up by, you know, destroying. Um, so like 40% of, uh, of the total uh, products we were bringing to Japan. So the consequences are very, very dire and can run you into trouble or you're importing into trouble. So don't under underestimate uh, this kind of uh, issues, the ingredients, the process, because you will be asked a lot of detailed question and you will need to go through that and answer that to be able to to get your products into japan um, and, and I and my, my experience also sometimes my suppliers had to go to their supplier who's had to go to the um, producer of that ingredient in another country and even then sometimes the uh, produce other uh, original ingredient producer may not have the information so you really need to know your ingredients and have your ducks in a line um, early on in the process to, to minimize if you want to be quick in that, in that uh, initial stage. That's so, so interesting for me to hear those practical stories from your experiences. And uh, thank you so much for emphasizing once again how important it is to pay, to pay attention to all the details and also make sure to have the right resources when it comes to, when the time comes to export to Japan, because obviously it takes patience, it takes resources, not only in terms of capital, but also manpower. So it's those examples really illustrate uh, what a person willing to export to Japan uh, needs, what the type of steps they need to take. But obviously Japan has, uh, after those challenges, there are a lot of opportunities for those uh, exporters. So it's good to learn from your experience. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so maybe we can move to the next question um, and just talk about um, now what it takes or what type of success factors uh, do international companies need when building a relationship with Japanese partner. We now talk about more on the practical operational side of uh, importing into Japan. But now how about the relationship between the people uh, or between the companies? So maybe we can start with Don. Uh, how did you experience uh, this relationship building in Japan and what tips can you, can you give to our viewers? Yeah, um, I, I give uh, general advice in that um, first thing is, is, is get your start right and that's choosing your choosing the right partner and taking time to choose it and and um if you want to do business and for a long time and, and grow your brand in, in japan that is yeah if you don't have that foundation right then um then you might not last as long as, as you hoped at the start. So you look at the co corporate culture. Is it a good fit for what your brand is trying to aspire? Do they have other brands that are uh, aligned with what you're trying to convey? Um, and also, yeah, if you can try and meet with, um, with 
people relatively high up in the, co in the company. You may not get to meet the CEO of uh, uh, Mitsubishi Shokuhi or one of the big shorts straight away, <laughs> um, but make sure you, you, you start on a firm footing there. And, and don't just go for the, the company that's offering the, the biggest order and the number of dollars uh, in front of you. If you want to be in Japan, it takes a lot of effort. And there's some people that might be just ch chasing the quick buck and they might have someone that knows that is in line that's looking for your product, but whether they're really prepared to put in the time and effort and the TLC, the tender loving care that your brand is going to need. Um, yeah, that's a big question that you need to uh, address early in the piece and also uh, be prepared yourself. Once you have, once you are, uh, have a partner, then the key is to provide them information time in a timely fashion in an easy to digest format. Remember, they're not they're probably not necessarily native uh, English speakers, um, and so the time it takes them to read your big messy flow chart or your um, scrabbly list of uh, ingredients um, is less time they have to actually get their product into into Japan. And also the other thing I would recommend is that, um, well, just, yeah, pre be prepared to be patient. And um, uh, as we've said a number of times in this webinar, that um, expect things to take time and not get anxious or um, too upset if things are taking longer and the level of questions are much deeper than you've ever encountered elsewhere. Um, that's Japan. Uh, it's going to be deep. It's going to take time, and there will be misunderstandings. So um, you just have that in your mind from the start. Go in with a, a an open mind and an open heart would be probably what I what I recommend. Thank you so much for that recommendation. I think also one point that you mentioned is the Japanese probably most of the time this is not their first language. It takes time. Being prepared, organized, always. Even bringing the details in advance in this practice is uh, maybe also one of the keys. So thank you for sharing that. And it's really valuable for people to be prepared rather to uh, and be like uh, realistic when it comes to Japan. So thank you for sharing that, um, for giving this to me. So Pascal, how about from your side? Yes, uh, I think what Don was saying is, is key. You have to, um, well, be very careful how you choose your partner. Then once you've done it, you need to consider that it will be a very long-term relationship. And that means you need to invest time uh, and money at the beginning and efforts to be able to build a strong foundation. And this, these foundations will be tested. They will be shaken uh, because at some point you will have trouble uh, because your product is not meeting the quality um, standards because you have mislabeling, because the packaging encountered some, some defects, whatever, some issues will come up. And at that time, that relation is going to be tested. That means the trust you've built, the partner will, uh, your importer will expect you to stand up for your product. That means go out of your way. Uh, as Don was saying, for example, to go to the supermarket to pick up that one bar which doesn't have um, the expiry date printed on it. That seems like stupid, not efficient on an economic perspective, but it would be expected that you do that. And if you don't, then expect the relationship to crumble and you not being able to deliver any product. There won't be any fuss, there won't be any cry, there won't be a big scandal, it's not China, but the relationship will end up. So be sure to understand uh, that this is very, very, key aspect in the relationship you will have, the fact that Japanese hate taking responsibility for that. So everything which is wrong with your product is supposed to be your responsibility and you will have to go out of your way to do that. If that means, uh, like in my experience, for example, opening up 10,000 uh, packs of products to check that there is no default effect on that overnight, you're supposed to do it. You're supposed to do it. If you don't do it, contract's over. So be very, very, very careful with that. Uh, it will take time, it will take cash, it will take uh, resources. So that's also one of the reasons 
um, when you do unit pricing, for example, you need to factor in the fact that things like this will happen. So if you don't want to be in the red, take the long time view, uh, take some buffer uh, to be able to protect the relationship. Thank you so much, Pascal, for this valuable tip. Especially, I saw some uh, some questions about pricing and giving this advice to put some buffer in your price for those that they say relationship building and maintenance is really important. Uh, and thank you both for emphasizing that building this relationship, building the trust, it takes so much time and effort from the person that exports to Japan. Uh, but once this is done, you make sure like your partner in Japan is also reliable. So it goes both ways, right? So uh, thank you for sharing your stories and thank you for explaining, uh, giving some examples from your experience. So uh, I'm really excited to move also to the next uh, question because I saw a couple of questions about that topic as well. Um, so finally, like what type of emerging opportunities there are for international food and beverage brands? Probably most of our viewers are from abroad. So they're quite excited to hear um, what are the emerging categories? What types of products uh, are seen here in Japan? So how about Don again, <laughs> could you please share a little bit more about your uh, opinion on this question? Yeah, I'm a, I've got a little bit of a, what's the word, um, a bias here because I'm <laughs> knee deep in the, in the better for you segment uh, in the uh, organic and plant-based segment. Um, so I, I think there's still a lot of uh, room for, uh, there's a lot of opportunities here in Japan in that segment particularly if you've got products that have no or few additives in them, if they're natural um, or if, and if they're kind of whole food based. But you do need to have a strong brand, brand story behind them. And um, yeah, you can't just have a, a normal label like, for example, vegan or, or paleo on, on them and think that that alone is going to sell you millions of units. You need to really um, have a strong uh, value proposition for the products. In recent, I've been in the last two months, I've been to um, exhibiting at two trade shows in, in that catering to that segment, two food shapes, food trade shows. And in those trade shows, we've kind of seen that um, vegan meat has kind of caught, it's, it's catching up, fast catching up. There is many different uh, brands of vegan meat in Japan now, or meat substitutes. So if you are uh, looking at that segment or even the uh, vegan product segment, uh, you've got to be moving quick or have a, a strong value proposition that's hard to replicate. And um, generally with COVID-19, people are, are not eating out as much as what they used to just because uh, yeah, of the lockdowns and uh, the shorter operating hours and no... Um, alcohol served in a lot of the pubs and uh, other places. So they are spending more in their homes. And I've noticed, uh, what's the word? Uh, um, people are paying more for pro products that are healthy and natural. And um, they know they come from uh, locations or producers that have um, strong track records or have, yeah, um, uh, can be trusted. Thank you for sharing that. It's really interesting because I met Don also at this uh, expo and uh, we were discussing like there are so many new vegan products. Uh, it's changing quite fast because, like, because usually Japan it takes two or three years. So it's uh, quite interesting to hear uh, as one of, from Don that this is one of the uh, emerging categories. So uh, I'm also looking forward to seeing more products on the show. How about Pascal? What do you think about it? I think same, uh, basically same point, uh, which is um, Japan is, uh, let's say, quite conservative uh, when it comes to importing um, products or categories. So the country in itself is a bit of a late comer, late adopter to the new trends. So uh, vegan is a case in point, uh, organic is a case in point. Uh, organic, for example, is, must be about 2% of the overall global consumption in Japan uh, compared to around 10% in, in Europe as of now. So it takes time for the global waves to 
reach the shores uh, of Japan and barriers to, to entry or habits, uh, consumption habits are, are quite um, hard to change. Now, COVID has been interesting because indeed, as Don was putting, uh, it disrupted quite a few uh, ingrained habits. So uh, one trend that is interesting for me is that, for example, frozen goods, frozen products are, are on the rise, whereby up until now, it was considered as something which is, you know, quite uh, degrading. Uh, if the, the mother of a family was, was using only frozen products, even though it might be good quality, then she's not supposed to do, she's not doing a job properly. She's not, gum, she doesn't gumbar, as we say in Japan, doesn't put enough efforts to be recognized as a proper housewoman, which is kind of crazy uh, because, you know, everybody's so busy, etc., and you have the product. But up until now, it was, it was quite clear, quite true. And with the fact of COVID, everybody's back at home and suddenly you don't have time to do everything. So you need to, to find alternatives. And that has been uh, one alternative. So I do see uh, sales chains like Picard, for example, now the French brand, the French chain, which uh, actually had been struggle, struggling quite a lot for the, for the few years. Uh, suddenly their online sales are picking up very, very quickly uh, because people just realized it's quite convenient and you can have actually a fairly good product at a decent price. So these um, things are, you know, disruptions uh, are occurring right now. Um, for vegan, also Japan is quite an interesting country because if you take a step backward, a hundred years ago, pretty much all the country was vegan. Nobody was eating meat, you know, very, you know, very, very rare occasions and not only the, let's say a very limited percentage of the population, mostly the, the, the samurai ca uh, caste and meat was outbanned, outlawed. So they went 180 degrees and now they're talking meat, 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 meat. And then slowly, even slowly, uh, now starting to realize, oh yeah, there might be options for a vegan, uh, a vegan, uh, a vegan diet. So it takes time. Um, being an early proponent of this means you need to educate the market. So educating a market, I've done it at Biosebo. God, takes time, resources, and you better have some good backing because you're going to be in for quite a few years. Um, but it's worth it. If you can play the long game and you have the resources to play the long game, then you're recognized as, you know, as the number one player on that market and winner takes all. So just many opportunities. Um, niches, some niches, you will always, always find people uh, willing to, to go into that. Uh, we didn't mention also about uh, halal, for example. Uh, you do have a, a small Muslim community which needs are absolutely not uh, really taken into account. So, you know, it's not markets which are across the whole country, um, but quite a good, uh, a good uh, opportunity to be there because basically no supply and a lot of demand. Thank you so much for emphasizing the those categories. So vegan, organic, frozen food, halal, um, healthy food is also Don was saying or something convenient that you can also prepare at home or drink at home so these are really interesting trends going on now in Japan um, and also we share some of those in our market shake newsletter as well so uh, if, unless, if you missed out this webinar or if you want to catch up in let's say a few months you can always check those as well so thank you so much for sharing your opinion and I'm sure like everybody has been waiting for the last part of, webin of our webinar, which is the Q&A session. So I want to welcome Vincent as well. Um, we've had quite a few questions going around the whole webinar. So I will, I will try to select um, some points. Uh, some are also directed to uh, particular people. Um, so the first question uh, that I want to ask uh, is about, uh, is from Arnie. And he asked, is there a, a change in customer preference or perception on selecting food and beverages from different geographies? So that's quite uh, an interesting uh, question. And he's asking them because uh, he, I assume he's from Australia because uh, what are some opportunity for Australian products or what are some complementary to European products? So 
more about geography. Are there any interests here in Japan about those uh, different products from different countries? So who would like to jump into that question? I'll, I'll jump, I'll have a try. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing as I'm a Kiwi, uh, uh, <laughs> close to Ernie there. Um, um, from a, a New Zealand Australian perspective, if we're talking about products that are predominant in Europe or have the high um, value in Europe, for example, an uh, easy example is olive oil or, or something like that. Uh, a, New Zealand, uh, a New Zealand company or Australian company exporting olive oil to Japan is going to have a harder um, route or it's going to have a harder time um, telling the Japanese market about their um, value proposition. It's much easier for a high, the same in the same price bracket. It's much easier for a European uh, or a Italian olive oil to come into Japan. So you do have um, you do have some um, yeah. There is some bias there. Uh, I'm not I'm not going to say it's impossible because there are a lot of diversity in the, in the olive oil brands throughout uh, Japan, but you do need to expect it to take time and give your importer um, a, a long runway <laughs> to to get your product out into the market. Thank you so much for sharing, then Don. Does somebody want to add something, or shall we move? Sure. Um, uh, I'd like to say it depends really on the category as well. Um, there are a lot of uh, sales, actually, uh, fresh goods coming into Japan from Australia. Uh, so fruits, veggies, uh, it's quite, um, you know, dried, dried fruits as well. Uh, quite a lot of volume coming up. Uh, so that makes sense. Now for the packaged goods, it's kind of a little bit of a different story, uh, especially, and now you have to deep into uh, morphology of people. So if I am taking uh, Australian cookies, which I looked into, for example, uh, into Japan, now the problem is you can feed a family of four people in Japan with one Australian cookie, basically. It's just too damn big. And if it's too big, that means also it's going to be too pricey, too expensive, and would be a very hot sell in Japan. So those factors as well uh, come into account. At Gusebon, we were retailing uh, Pana chocolate, which is a, an Australian chocolate, uh, quite very good. But for Panna chocolate, uh, 40 grams are selling at around 900 yen uh, at the store. So that's about you know $7, whereby I can bring the same chocolate from Europe, I mean, similar quality, uh, and I will sell 100 gram choco for about the same price. So cost will be an issue. The perception will be an issue. The packaging uh, might be an issue. It really depends what you're talking about. Uh, same thing, Australian Australian wines, uh, especially in organic, you do have quite a few, very good quality, uh, just like from New Zealand as well. But, you know, uh, if I get them to Japan, uh, it's going to be 5,000 yen a bottle, whereby I can get very good quality uh, Italian and French wine for about 2,000 yen. So when people with uh, moderate means, I would say, uh, are looking at that, they have to make decisions. And if you're twice or three times as expensive as another product, it would be very, a very hot sale. Thank you, Pascal, for sharing that. Um, Vincent, do you want to add something? Or? Very shortly, uh, coming back to the first question, which was also about kind of like geographical difference in terms of consumption. I think for most of the imported products, you know, it's more, it's more related to this kind of like key uh, urban areas that we mentioned. Uh, mostly, there is not so much big difference. There are some kind of exception, as a prefecture in the north, where the, the 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 consumption per capita of wine, for example, is higher. Hokkaido also is more westernized in terms of in terms of food habits. And then there is also some exception related to local or historical um, non-Japanese communities. So uh, historically, you know, uh, Japanese Brazilian people, for example, in some areas, uh, lots of also of um, people from time in some uh, in some uh, geographies and so on. So that could be the exception, but uh, for most of the exporter, you don't have to assume a very big uh, difference in terms of consumption. The big difference is more like, remember that Japan, it's both like Hokkaido and Okinawa, which is tropical. So of course, you know, also depending on the on the product, you might have more potential in, uh, in some region and less in other region. Thank you so much for mentioning that. And that there was also one question about um, 
uh, how about selling wines in Japan? But as you said, like some regions are uh, focused on wine, some are focused on another product. It really depends on the geography, really depends on the type of category that the different regions enjoy. So I think having a good sophisticated research before entering the country or entering the market, like particular geography is important to find out what type of products the customer actually likes. So thank you for mentioning that. And I have an interesting question from Johan Faskam. Uh, he asked how hard was the on-trade market hit by COVID and do you see revival of the sector? So mostly about the bars, the restaurants. Um, so we would like to hear your opinions. Uh, who would like to take an on, on this one? Maybe so as, the, as the alcoholic beverage guy, I will answer to this one. Um, it has been a very difficult period for the last uh, two months. The basically the alcoholic beverage sales were kind of banned in uh, in bars and restaurants since the third week of April. The situation actually is that from this week, the state of emergency is over. There are still restrictions on the alcoholic beverages, and sometimes it's Kafkaesque, you know, with lots of uh, rules that are very difficult to understand. But we feel that in the industry, uh, especially like uh, most of the, the, even like the food service companies, from this week really, it's restarting. The, the issue is that all the bars and restaurants need have to close at 8 p.m. and the last order for alcoholic beverages is at 7 p.m. Uh, but still, we are back into uh, a minus, I will say like 20% trend while we were, you know, at uh, seven, minus 70% trend, you know, a few weeks ago. So uh, yeah. much better than before. Yeah. Thank you so much for mentioning that. And there is also a follow-up question on that one. Uh, so this is from... Oh, just a second, I lost it. Um, so there is, uh, oh yeah, there is a follow-up question asked by Diva Aldora. So she mentioned, of course, now due to COVID, its consumption is, uh, might be hit as well and uh, restaurants or outlets are hit as well. So demand might be like way, a little bit worse than before. So she's asking, is it now the right time to export to Japan or what would be the right timing to start considering uh, exporting to Japan uh, with concern to the COVID situation? So how about, let's say Pascal? Yeah, so I think it has different, as we said before, uh, the COVID has uh, developed or launched some new trends. Um, and also change a little bit the way people are doing their, their purchases. Uh, notably, e-commerce is on the rise. Some categories have said, uh, for example, frozen is on the rise. And the fact that people are not going to the restaurants anymore uh, has actually shifted some of the uh, consumption to some a little bit more premium products towards the store. Uh, so we said, for example, the bars being closed. Uh, a lot of people who were going you know, for drinking with colleagues, etc., or some of the gourmet customers, uh, are not able to go to the favorite bar to enjoy their, their cocktails. So they are trying to um, cover up basically by going and purchasing a little bit higher quality products at the store. So not everywhere, obviously, but uh, in the more, let's say, affluent areas uh, and some of the more supermarkets, we could see that, uh, for example, $200, $300 wines, uh, good Bourgogne, uh, whereby we're selling you know, one bottle a month uh, as of late, sales were like more 10 bottles a month. So people want to just relieve uh, part of the stress and just gratify themselves a little bit uh, because they don't have means to spend their cash. And the situation in Japan uh, actually is with uh, the support from the government, the cash had, uh, handouts and the restaurants also have been supported. It's not as bad as some other countries. Uh, people are not dying out on the streets. So there is still cash available. Uh, to, to, to purchase good products. And Japanese are interested in, in, in new things. So there is no, I don't think now is a bad timing, actually. Obviously, you still have to research because the channels, uh, if you are going with liquor, for example, towards bars, FNB, Horeca, it's totally different channels uh, if you want to go to the supermarkets. And that's one of the issues that, for example, the, the liquor importers or the distributors currently are facing. And, and for the brands, uh, it's just not, okay, I can't sell to the bars, then let's switch to the supermarkets. Just pushing a button doesn't work like that. 
because the, the industry is not structured that way. So you have uh, these kind of barriers uh, which make uh, which you need to take into consideration into your strategy. Otherwise, you will have issues. So distribution channels, uh, size also for the product. Uh, say for example, it's not limited to import products, but for um, the sake, the Nihon shoe makers. Uh, if you're selling to a bar, then you may have the two liter bottles. Uh, if if it's for your own personal consumption, two liters of Nihon shoe uh, for one evening. Well, some people can do it, but uh, not everyone, unfortunately. Uh, it might be a little bit different. So you have to have smaller bottles. And that means that you need to be able to bottle that uh, at your factory. And if not, it's additional investments, different channels, et cetera, et cetera. So really that is um, quite dimensioning. So quite these barriers need to be taken into account if you want to be successful. Thank you I'd for just, sharing. Yeah, I'll just add a little bit to that um, because I think it's a really good um, uh, a good topic. Um, I I think oh, I just wanted to add to that about the costs of bringing products to Japan. Obviously with the air traffic um, lower and also sea freight right. um, uh, challenged at the moment. Uh, it is harder to get your products to Japan and more expensive. But on the other side, um, initially, you're probably not going to be doing large volumes. So from my experience in the trade shows over the last uh, couple of months, trade shows are still being held in Japan. But obviously, there's fewer uh, imported or fewer companies coming out from overseas. So you have less competition for from over other um, over other overseas companies and also uh, the attendees are down but they're motivated so we, when I have my booth the last uh, over the last couple of months I've had good motivated attendees not just people coming here for a, a few three a few free snacks had motivated people coming to the trade shows and uh, another benefit has been that the trade shows have been struggling as well. So they've been able to reduce their prices with a little bit of government aid um, to, uh, to, to help as well. So it's cost less for uh, a better quality of um, visitors to my booth and the attention has still been good. And there's been additional um, focus on healthy products. So obviously it's going to depend on your segment, but if you wanted to start making footstep putting footsteps into japan then now is a good time in my opinion um but like any as with any other time it, you can't expect things to move quickly and it's going to depend on the segment that you're in thank you so much for the comment don as well we have three minutes left so i would like to ask you one final question for one sentence of a response so Joe Moore and Luke McDonald are asking for what is your recommendation of approaching Japanese partners? What would be the best channel or the best way to approach a Japanese importer, Japanese wholesalers as an exporter outside of Japan? So, Don, one final word. <laughs> This is the million dollar question. <laughs> I wish I had a, a solution for it. <laughs> I've been saying this family jewels if I was able to give you a good answer to that. But uh, um, I've, I've been doing it gradually and I've found that trade shows have been um, successful. And so if you've got a new product, um, getting yourself at a trade show, you can do that by reaching out to people that specialize in it or doing it through a chamber of commerce. Most countries have a chamber of commerce that are able to help with that. Um, getting in trade shows and putting your best foot forward with uh, a product and, and turning up with some localized explanations and preferably some products that have already landed in Japan um, is also helpful. That'd be my recommendation. I don't know, yeah. um, but uh, Vincent and Pascal, do you have any other? other yeah, suggestions? I totally concur. Basically, the, you have to keep in mind that Japanese people are not very conceptual people. Uh, they're very touchy feely, uh, very practical uh, people. So, if you want to promote your product or try to sell your product, you need to get your product in Japan, uh, one way, one way or the other. So some, some of the chambers, uh, especially the French chambers, is not on a putting um, programs to be able to import samples uh, on your behalf. 
and then engage in the first kind of uh, engagement level uh, with the, the usual suspects, uh, being the department stores, being the, the large chains like Eon. So that will give you um, the opportunity to get your product tested and have a first feedback as to the, uh, the uh, well, interest that the buyers may have. So it's, I think it's really key. Um, also, I would recommend uh, when the, well, the borders will be open again, uh, to go and do the, the trade route, uh, the trade show is important because you need to be able to gather uh, first, let's say, hand information and walk through uh, the different department stores, different retail environment to understand better by yourself what it is, uh, what you can find on the shelf, what's the competition, and, and get to talk to the people. Because as we said, it's worth the investment. It's a long-term commitment. And you'll understand better um, basically what we discussed about. It may seem a little bit uh, too theoretical, um, but if you're willing to do that step, also I think the, you know, the, Jap the Japanese importer uh, will be reinsured as well. Because you see, you're sending, you're backing your product and you're willing to make uh, a commitment and for them uh, to build that trust. I think that kind of thing is really, really key. And you'll understand better also whether Japan is for you or not at this stage. Because uh, maybe the last point I would like to ask uh, Japan may not be uh, the right country for you at that stage if you're not ready, and it's better to postpone it than just burn your brand uh, forever. Uh, Japanese people tend to have long memory, so please don't don't come if you're not prepared, if you're not ready. You'll do more damage uh, to to everyone and to yourself. So just take your time, be ready, and then uh, if you are ready, just commit yourself fully. That's it for me. Thank you so much for the tips. Vincent, do you have something to add how to uh, how to find partners here in the Japanese market? No, but I think it's, you know, uh, what, what Pascal explained, you know, uh, basically cover this. Be prepared to prospect for a long time. You're not going to find a distributor probably by, just by sending like random emails um, and also contact us, you know, you will, uh, we can connect you with our consultant because you will need probably also uh, local support. So, so I think be prepared for for long prospecting uh, period, and also with the right tools to do that, which is like for example the sales presentation, having some information already prepared in Japanese and so on. I think it's it's really about also preparing yourself before you even start to you know the the prospecting, which is which uh, is which is critical. I think to uh, to approach the Japanese market. Thank you so much, Vincent, for mentioning that. Um, and also for all the comments from Don and Pascal, uh, just wanted to conclude that we are always here and available. So let us know if you need any support or you have any questions, we'll be happy to connect. And I want to thank everybody for participating in today's webinar and to Don, Pascal and Vincent for the wonderful insights and all the tips. We have one final surprise that I mentioned in the beginning of the webinar. Uh, we decided that as a first webinar and uh, we want to express our gratitude for everybody that joined us. So we'll be organizing uh, uh, 10, uh, 10 consultations, 30 minute consultations to our participants. So please expect an email from us uh, where you can submit a form uh, with more information about your company. And we will select 10 companies that can have a 30 minute consultation with Borming Pro. And we can advise you on how to enter the Japanese market. So stay tuned for those emails. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much to Don Pascal and Vincent. Uh, we were so delighted to have you all. Uh, and please stay tuned for uh, the rest of the webinar series. Have a wonderful day ahead or evening ahead. And uh, let's keep in touch. Thank you so much.